right in this moment, God. Lord, as we're about to read your word, Lord, we need you, God. Just fill us with your spirit, with your understanding, Lord. We know, God, that you've drawn each person here, Lord, for a reason, Lord, for a purpose, God. You desire to speak to all of us, God. And, uh, we just ask for your will to be done in this place, Lord, for the walls and the barriers around our hearts, God, for the distractions, the pressures and the trials of this world that for a moment, Lord, that they would just fall down, God. Lord, that you would work in, in your people, Lord, in the way you desire. Just pray for Pastor Jacob. We pray that you would use him to rightly divide your word. And that, Lord, that you'd be blessed by it all, Lord. All of the glory is yours. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Well, right on, guys. Well, good evening to you. Um, obviously, Pastor Zeke is out. He's visiting family. He's out and about. Um, what a week it's been. Well, even, even the week before that with, uh, with VBS and... And everything, it's just been busy, it's just been crazy, so people are out, you know, people are just not feeling, feeling a little under the weather, so, uh, so we've just been, we just been going, it's like we have this uh, ragtag crew right now going, so it's been good. I, I would imagine this is how like a, 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 like a, a startup, when someone's starting the church up, everything's just like everywhere and you're trying to figure things out. That's how I would imagine this was, this is kind of like today, but um, when, uh, when Zeke isn't here on Thursday nights, um, we're going over... Um, we're in the book of James tonight, yes. We're going to be in chapter 4. We're going to finish chapter 4 of James this evening, if you guys want to turn there. Um, the only really announcements we have is uh, we have family camp coming up. Um, the, the, the location has changed. Um, it's, it was going to be at this Lobo campground, um, but, we, but there, there weren't a lot of uh, amenities there, a lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of necessity things that you would think we would probably need for, uh, you know, because we're, we're a little, uh, yeah, we're a little... Uh, I guess you can call it, you know, we're, we're not as rugged as we maybe want to think, but we're, we're going to this area called uh, Herky Creek, uh, kind of in the Idlewild area. Um, it's really nice. There's a, it's right by Lake Hemet. Um, there's a creek and everything. There's, there's a lot of other things. There's a playground. So a lot more things we can do there. So uh, if you still want to go, I mean, I, they, I think we can, I think it's still, there's still openings available. So you know, if I can, if I can tempt you a little bit in a good way, right? I know we we don't we want to flee from temptation, but you know, fellowship, temp, temptation to fellowship with each other, I think it's a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be in um, James chapter four, starting at verse seven. So if you guys want to turn there, we're going to read and we're going to uh, take the rest of the chapter this evening, and then uh, yeah, and then we'll the, we'll go about our day after that. So this is what it says: James chapter four, starting at verse seven. Therefore, uh, submit therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Verse 11, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and one judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Verse 13, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Let's pray. Lord, as we get into your word, Father, Lord, we, we desire, Father, I, um, I pray, Lord, it's our desire to know you more, Lord, to draw closer to you, Father. Lord, to know what it means to, to submit to you, Father, and, uh, and be pleasing to you, God, Lord. There's so many things out there, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that we battle with in our life, Lord. There's, there's the world, Lord. There's, there's our flesh, Lord, that, that, that wars against the Spirit, Father. And there's, uh, then there's the enemy, Lord. And, uh, Lord, all those things are, are, um, are fighting, Lord, to, to have rule and reign in our life, Father. But we want to submit to you, Lord, and have you rule and reign in our life, God. So, so Lord, help us, Lord. Uh, and nothing, nothing is uh, different, Lord. Uh, 2,000 years ago, as James was writing to these Christians, Lord, they were dealing with the same issues that we deal with today, Lord, in 2022, Lord. So, 
So help us to um, open our, our ears, Lord, and our hearts to hear your word, Father. So we thank you. In your name, amen. <clears throat> amen. So um, last time we were in the book of James, it was back in March. So just to kind of hopefully kind of catch us up to speed, uh, James, is uh, he's the overseer of the church in Jerusalem at this time. This is, uh, this is when the church was still kind of predominantly Jewish, right? This was still early, early on um, in the church of, of Jesus Christ. Um, and James, this James that we're talking about here, is the half-brother of Jesus, which is, which is interesting when you, when you get down to it, because he calls himself in the beginning, he calls himself a servant of the Lord, right? He could have easily said, oh, I'm, 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 ha- I'm his half-brother. That could have been a, something he could have said to give him a little more street cred, if you will, some credibility. Uh, but he's, no, he called himself a serving, servant because he realized, and if you know the story of, of uh, a little bit of James, um, in the Gospels, he's not really mentioned too much, but he's alluded to because it talks about how, how uh, you know, after, after Jesus was born, um, you know, Mary and Joseph, they had other kids, and one of these was James, and they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't see him as a Messiah. They kind of thought he was kind of crazy. At one point, they tried to take him and say, hey, let's, let's try to get him out of here off the scene just to get him out because he's, he's not in his right mind. So, so early on when Jesus was on the scene doing his earthly ministry, James James didn't even uh, recognize him as the Messiah. He thought he was just his crazy brother, right? And so, and we see after, um, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul mentions that when Jesus rose again and he appeared to Peter and the other apostles, he also appeared to James as well. And so we see that after that, it, it, would, it would seem like James became a believer. He saw this, and he became the the overseer of the church of um, Jerusalem. But what was happening during this time is that is that a lot of the Jewish people were being um, kind of, you know, uh, expelled out of Jerusalem in that area, so they had to kind of go all over. They call this the dispersion of the Jewish people, and they're going out to all these different Jewish communities all around uh, the surrounding areas of Israel and even outside of Israel. And James <coughs> is talking to these Christians He's writing to these believers who are, who are Jewish. He calls them brothers, right, brethren. Um, but he's writing to them because, uh, you know, uh, not only are they Jewish, and even in the Gentile world, you know, a lot of the Jewish people were, were um, looked down upon, right? There, there was that, that kind of um, thing going on there. But then after that, in these Jewish communities, they were Christians, which was even worse. So now they were kind of even looked even more down upon. It's like, well, they're not even they're, they, they think this Jesus fellow is their Messiah. So the, even these Jewish Christians were, uh, they had a just, they had a rough time at, at life, right? And they were going through all these things. And James writes to them. And one of the first things we read, you guys, you guys might know the verse. He says, hey, count it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, right? Kind of the, the main overarching theme of the book of James is maturing in the Lord. And that's what we need to do as Christians, right? Each, each and every one of us are called to grow in our, in our relationship and our knowledge of Jesus Christ, not to just stay in one place. There, there should never be a point in our life as Christians where we're like, I'm good where I'm at. I'm comfortable, right? Um, because we're called to grow, right? And a lot of our growing process is the Lord allowing trials in our life. I, I mean, I'll be the first one to say like, you know, James chapter one, when he talks about, he counted all joy, brethren. It's kind of hard to do that, right? It's like, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't, I don't want to count it joy. But we understand what he says, what he's saying here. He says, hey, because the, the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let that endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Because what, what that does, what a trial does in the life of a Christian, it shows what our faith is made of. You understand? It shows us, that, okay, how, how, how submitted am I to Jesus Christ? How, how much do I trust in him with everything in my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly? Because those things are going to come in life. And so he talks all about that. Like his, uh, a lot of his, uh, his letter, it's kind of, uh, it's very practical, but it's kind of in your face. Like he loves these people enough to tell them like it is, even if it kind of hurts their feelings, right? Like James and Paul, they're kind of my guys. I like those guys, right? They, they're, they're kind of no nonsense. <clears throat> um, yeah, they, they knew how to be gracious, but sometimes it's, you know, just like a, any parent when they, when they're, when their child, when we talked about this one in Galatians, with Paul, it's like, hey, I love these people, but like you're messing up and you're just like frustrated and you're like, what, what are you doing, right? What, what are you thinking? And, and this is kind of the idea because what was happening is, is after a while, there, he had to deal with some issues in the church and with these believers. They're, um, they're you know, they're, they're using their, their mouth and their words to, to cut each other down. He talks about the tongue and how, and how they can, it can do all these things. There's issues there. 
um, even in regards to their faith, they're saying they're Christians and they're believers, but but their actions weren't showing that that their that they that their faith was was that strong, right? We know the the idea of a faith without works is dead. All these things that he was talking about, and he's dealing with these believers because he wants them as a, as a loving pastor. He's like, no, I want you guys to grow, right? Just like a just like a parent, we want our children to grow, right, to mature, and not just to stay like little babies any, anymore. We want them to grow up into so they can um, grow up and be functioning people in society, right? But as, as Christians, we want them to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and in the relationship. So because, again, the, um, one day they're going to leave our house, and uh, if they know Jesus well, if we've taught them how to walk with Jesus well, then they're going to be fine, right? They're going to be fine. Um, and, and this is what James is trying to do. They're all, the, these Christians are dispersed all over the place, and he's trying to help them to mature so they can continue and be um, a light to Christ. And so uh, the, this, what, uh, the last time we were in the book of James, um, Kevin Lisby was, was teaching, and he did an awesome message. But he talked about, again, another thing that was happening with these believers is that they were, they were fighting with each other. It says there was quarrels and conflicts among them, and James is addressing that. And, and the idea is that they were warring against each other. And the reason because of that is because there were each, these, these Christians, these believers were being, um, they were kind of being fueled and led by their passions and their pleasures. And, and they were just being driven by those things, and because of that, um, what usually happens is, is we begin to treat other people, right, not uh, not as Christ would want us to, and and because they're being fueled by those things and just wanting to live for themselves, um, there's a conflict there because we know what the Word of God says that we're supposed to build each other up and to and to uh, regard each other as higher than ourselves. You can't do that when you're just being, right. Um, when you're just wanting to be fulfilled with your own pleasures and your own desires, those two things are going to be in conflict, and it's going to cause issues. And it was causing issues in these churches. <clears throat> they were being right, ruled over by their lust and all those things. And and, uh, and James, again, because he loves them, or he calls them brethren a lot of times, but then he says, hey, you guys were like, he calls them adulteresses, right? Not that they were physically doing that, they were, that they were cheating on their spouses, but he's saying, spiritually speaking, like you were, you were um, being unfaithful to your Lord who redeemed you. Because you're you're just you're just living for yourself right now. It's like you're we're we've, we're called to live for Jesus now. If you're giving your life to Christ, like you belong to Him, and that's the idea that He's talking about here. And these are the things that He was dealing with. Um, he wasn't again. He wasn't going to just l- allow them to do that. And some of His word, he might seem harsh, right? Especially in our in our day and age now, where uh, you know, we're we're sometimes we're a little more sensitive than than uh, what we used to be, right? You, if you call somebody adulterous now, you might uh. They might unfriend you on uh, on Facebook or Instagram or try to have you canceled and all those things because you can't say those words because you know it's it's not nice it's uh, it's not loving as Christ is loving but but uh, but sometimes it, it you have to you have to call it out and he says hey uh, in verse four of chapter four it says you adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is is hostility towards God right therefore whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself out to be an enemy of God. And again, this is what they were doing. They were getting caught up in this world and the world system and all these things, and they were indulging in the flesh. And and uh, and when they were supposed to be trying to edify each other and, and trying to be a light and, and further the kingdom of God, they were just about themselves. And uh, and again, um, James is dealing with this. And these again, these are the the what happens when we give into those things. Is it, it's pretty clear, right? He says, "Hey, you become an enemy." of God, like we, we, those things, um, wage war. It says this in first John chapter two, verses 15 through 17 says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. Those things are not from the father, but from the world. And then it says this at the end, but the world is passing away and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God will live forever. And I think this is a, especially key, again, in our day and age when, uh, when there's a lot of churches who, who want to be pleasing to the world. They want to be friendly with the world. They want to be liked by the world. Um, the Bible's pretty clear. Like, we're, we're, not, we're, we're, we're not of this world, right? We're called into this world. We're called to engage with people, to be a light to them. But, but there's a difference when, when we're called to be in the world and be a light to Jesus, and we're starting to become friends of the world. What usually happens is, is, uh, is the world and its influence begins to... Uh, influence us, right? And not the other way around. We, when we begin to mix, um, when we, when we want to accept the ideas of the world and all these things so we can be friendly with them, um, what happens is we begin to mix all these things with Christ, and it's not supposed to be that way, right? 
but um, <clears throat> but that's that's what happens. The world and its system and its ideas always tend to take over. And for us as Christians, this is something that we need to be aware of, because it's always going to be that way. There's always within within us as Christians, there's always going to be that war brewing between uh, with the world system and and uh, that's you know that doesn't want anything to do with God. Right? There's a flesh. It talks about when we we're in Galatians not too long ago. Um, this is the the flesh and the Holy Spirit. They, they they're they're in opposition to each other. You have that that's in us, right? They're that daily surrender to the Lord, or else that um, it's it's going to be easier for us to give into our old nature, our old our old habits. But then we have one more thing, right? We have the world, we have the flesh, but then we have the the enemy, right? The devil. He's there, like, uh, and and uh, if you've read anything, if you if you've ever studied, you know, in regards to the. Right, the devil, the the enemy, the the adversary, whatever, however you want to call him, like one of his one of his great sins is pride, and that's what it comes. That's that's what we're going to be talking about today because the main verse is submitting therefore to God, right? There's a there's a a contrast between that submitting to God, and pride, and that's what the enemy does, and and I would say it's one of his greatest weapons is pride, and the idea because um, one of the first things we see when he comes on the scene in Genesis, he tells Eve, he makes her a promise. He's like, hey. Uh, you won't die if you eat this fruit. You'll become like God, right? And that that kind of caught her attention, right? Just like just like just like we do, right? When when uh, it, it's this idea of hey, we we uh, we're masters of our own self. We know what's best for us. And that was a, that was the thing with this uh, you know with this fruit with this um, with this one rule that God gave Adam and Eve. He's like, are you going to trust me for for what's good? Are you going to trust in me? You're going to trust in yourself, and then the enemy comes along and gives, a, gives this false promise, hey, you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. It's, you're just going to be like God, and that enticed her, and we know the story that she took and she ate and then she gave to Adam. But this is what happens with pride, right? It's, it's this idea, it's like, hey, I know, uh, I know what's best for me. I can handle this. I got this. Um, Paul says this, too, when he's talking to Timothy, and he's, uh, he's establishing this church and, and uh, being the pastor of this church in Ephesus, he tells Timothy this about about overseers who want to be pastors and leaders in the church. In 1 Timothy 3, 6, he says, And uh, don't let them be new converts so that he will not become conceited, right, or prideful or arrogant and fall into condemnation, the condemnation that's incurred by the devil. Right, you see the, the idea, this is, this is one of the, the things, that, um, the warnings that's out there. Um, like, uh, I, I have this desire. I've always had the desire to be like a DIYer, right, to do things myself because it's good. Like, I, I want to know those things. Sometimes it's cost-effective, right, to know those things. Sometimes it's not. It's cheaper just to buy something at Hobby Lobby, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, but, but, but just to know those little, those little, uh, uh, those little helpful skills, right? Those, those things are helpful at times, um, and I like doing those things, but when it comes to spiritual things, like, I, I can't be a DIY, I can't DIY it, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm incapable of doing that. Like, I need, I need Jesus, right? I need Christ, right? I need to be submitted to him. I need uh, his grace, right? We just, uh, just earlier at the, in verse six, he says, hey, he gives greater grace. Therefore, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Like I, when it comes to spiritual things, I, I am capable of doing it myself, right? And, uh, but this is what Satan does. Sometimes uh, we have this idea, like he dangles certain things in front of us, like the lustful things, those type of things, passions. Um, but I think sometimes what he does is he, he, uh, he dangles in front of us, uh, Right, that he, he kind of uh, in, inflates our ego and says, "You got this. You're, you're fine. You can do it without Christ. You can do this, or you can you can do that." And um, and we see that when he tempted Jesus, right? He says, "Hey, uh, you're you're hungry. You're the son of God. Why don't you turn the stone into bread?" Right? Why don't you just uh, throw yourself off of the the top of the temple? The angels will catch you. This that's what the Word of God says. It's like all you can have all these things now. That all these kingdoms, um, if you just worship me now, right? All and all these things that that we see, and um, that's what he offers us as well, right? He, he, he dangles those things that, hey, you can, you can do this your own. You can build your own kingdom. You can uh, be the master of your own destiny and all these things, um, and he offers those things to us. But at the end, we understand, right? I hope we understand that it, it leads to, to emptiness and to destruction. And so the question is now, as we get into this section, like how do we fight against those things? This is there. It's going to be there. Um, until until we're out of this earth and with with Christ, we're going to be battling, right? That's that's part of the Christian life. Is we're gonna as we're drawing closer to Jesus each and every day. There's always going to be something to trip us up. So how do we fight against this, right? Well, you know, James gives us the answers. That's always the great thing, right? Yeah. About the Word of God. 
if you read and study it, like the answers are there. Right? That's what I tell the youth all the time. It's like, hey, like read your Bible. Like open your Bible like every day. It shouldn't just be Sundays and Thursdays that you open it up. Like read it for yourself. Know Jesus for yourself. Understand how to do it. If you have questions, yeah, that's what I'm here for. Um, but but read, like know Jesus for yourself. Open your Bible. Be familiar with the Word of God because it has the answers, right? And, um, and the first thing we say, we see in verse 7 is submit therefore to God. And this, this word submit, yeah, the, the idea behind it is getting into the proper rank. Um, I like like uh, old war movies and, and, you know, especially movies about like World War II and stuff like that. And especially when, uh, you know, you have your you have you have a rank in order. And if you have like a new private who comes in, but they start wanting to act like they're a lieutenant or a general even and think they know everything, it's going to cause issues. Right. Because they don't know everything. And uh, this idea behind, hey, um, get into your proper rank, because what happens again with this idea of pride is uh, we think that we're the highest authority, that we know what we're talking about and we can do these things. And uh, in, in a sense, we become, again, our own masters, our own, our own God, if you will, because uh, we know what's best instead of what God does. Um, Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, hey, no, no, no man is without a master. And sometimes we think, hey, if I'm going to do this thing my own, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I can figure this out. I can be, again, the, the master of my own destiny. And when we give in to sin, right, when we give in to the schemes of the, the devil, he, uh, or he makes us think, right? There's this idea. It's like, oh, yeah, this is... This is, this is my life. I have the power to do whatever I want to do. What we don't understand is that we're just kind of putting ourselves under a different master, right? Jesus says those things. But, uh, but even back in the, uh, in the Old Testament in the beginning, after Adam and Eve, after uh, they sinned and, and they were expelled from the garden, then we, we run into Cain and Abel. And if you guys know the story, it says that um, Abel and Cain, they came and gave sacrifices to the Lord. And it says that um, God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he didn't accept Cain's, and it says that Cain's, uh, his, his countenance fell. He got angry, and God, and God kind of talks to him about it, right? <clears throat> he says um, in Genesis 4, 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I always love this verse because that's the idea behind desire for you. It's like, hey, it wants to rule over your life. That's what sin does, and that's, that's the false promise, right, the trap that, 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 the, that the enemy puts in front of us. Like, hey, you can be your own master. You can do what you want to do, just like with Adam and Eve. It's like, oh, you can be just like God, but they realize right away after they ate that fruit, it was like, oh, no, this isn't, this isn't all it was, it was supposed to be, right? Their eyes were open. They were ashamed. They hid, right? They hid from, from, the, from the God that they once had, like, this, this sweet fellowship with. This, that's what sin, uh, sin does. It, it leads to death. Satan knows that. But he's, he's very good at like, dangling those things and putting things in front of us that, that kind of make it seem like, oh, it's not that bad. But that's what we do when, when we do those things, and, and it's only when we submit to God, right? Um, we order ourselves under God that we're going to be able to resist. It says, it says um, submit, therefore, to God, and then resist the devil, right? It's not the other way around. It's not, it's not I can resist the devil and, um, and then you know, submit to God. It, we, uh, apart from Jesus, we can't do that. Right, apart from the Lord, from my submission to him and saying, hey, Lord, you, you have the power. I don't have no power to resist any of these temptations that come my way or anything that, you know, the, the enemy dangles in front of me to try to lure me away from you. Like, I can't do that apart from you. And so that's, uh, that's the order of things. Submit to God, then resist the devil. And this idea of resist, it, it comes from two words, to stand and to be against. And what it means, resist, right, it means it means that to not comply with emotions and temptations. We understand that, right? When, when, uh, uh, when someone's resisting arrest, they're not complying, right? Obviously, don't do that. But when it comes to Satan, resisting Satan, yeah, you, you resist him, right? But only in the power that God supplies. Like, again, apart from Christ, I can't do those things. And then it says when we do that, it says we will flee. Um, then, then the devil will flee from us. And the thing about this resistance that we're supposed to do this this ongoing thing in the submission to God, it's, it's lifelong, right? It's not like we're just like, hey, I read my Bible. I just went to a, um, a retreat or something, and so I, I should be good for the next, I don't know, couple weeks. I don't really have to read my Bible or be in devotion time or be in fellowship. Like, it's, th- this, should, this should carry me on. It, it doesn't work that way. Each and every day is a new battle, and, and, um, and we need to know that our, our resistance, our submitting to Christ and you know, resisting the enemy, it's, it's lifelong, right? until we're home with Jesus, then we're going to be away from those things. 
and we see this again in the life of uh, of other of other people in um in the Bible with you know with David. If we uh, <coughs> if you guys know the story of David with Bathsheba, right? We what happens, right? He he gave into sin, right? For whatever reason, he took his eyes off the Lord, and and uh, and because of that, he got caught up with Bathsheba, and then she ends up being pregnant, and then she has her husband, or he has her husband killed. Um, but what was happening is. Um, because of his pride, because he, he allowed those things to happen, he started warring with the Lord. It says in Psalms 32, verses 3 and 4, it says, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. This is what happens, right? When we allow sin into our lives, when we allow, when we think we, as Christians especially, right, when we think we know better, than God, and we give in to certain things or do certain things, um, right? I, God doesn't allow his children to sin successfully, right? And so with David, when he when he says when he kept silent about his sin, we, when he didn't submit to God and confess those things, it, 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 uh, it wore on him, right? It was heavy upon him. And, and that's what it says. It says, uh, like, the, my body wasted away. It says, your hand was heavy upon me. Right? Isn't, isn't that what sin does in our life when we don't confess it as a as a, as a child of God, as um, or as someone who's a follower of Jesus, and when we're in sin and we don't confess those things, like it, it's heavy, right? It's heavy upon our lives, and it's going to be that way until we confess those things. Um, it says in Psalms 51, right, the same type of thing. It says this: uh, "Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions." Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. And again, these two chapters uh, in Psalms 32 and 51, this is, this is the, the result of, of that sin with Bathsheba. Um, but this is what happens when and we see this in David's life. He wasn't submitted to, to the Lord, right? He gave in to sin. He he thought, well, this is, um, he took his eyes off the Lord and he, he paid the price for it, right? God had to discipline him and um, and deal with him. But then after, when he finally submitted to the Lord, when he finally confessed his sins, it says in, a, again, Psalms 32, um, it says this right here. One of my favorite verses, it says, he says this, how blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. How blessed is a man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. I like that because he, he realized like, man, this is, this is what I needed to do. I needed to confess my sin and God forgave, right? And we know again, just like it says back in, in verse six, it says, hey, he gives a gr- greater grace because that's what God does. And so after we do these things, after we submit to God, then we can resist the devil and he'll flee from us. Then there's this invitation, that God gives us. It says here, it says in verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. All right, when we confess our sin, um, that's when we're able to draw closer to God. There's that principle in the Bible, right, that, that like sin separates us from God, right? That, that's, uh, and we see that again with Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they hid from God. <clears throat> it says that they, they heard the, the Lord walking in the garden after they, they, uh, they sinned and they covered themselves, they hid from the Lord. That intimacy was gone now. That's what happens in our life when we allow sin in our life. Um, that intimacy is severed, even even with each other, right? Uh, if you have a spouse or or, um, or even just with with uh, other believers, if we're in sin, there, there's a there's a disconnect there. There's something that's severed because that's what sin does. And again, there's a reason why we, uh, you know, that that it says a lot about sin, especially in the New Testament, because it, it leads to death. It causes issues. It's um. It's not for us, but when we confess our sin, then it says we can draw close to God. And it says, and the promise is he will draw near to us. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 13 says it this way. Um, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And, and uh, the thing I love about the Lord is like he doesn't, right, he doesn't play how to go seek. You know what I'm saying, right? He doesn't, when, when, when you're truly seeking him, he's going to make himself known to you. He doesn't play games like that. Like he, that's what his desire is. Right, it says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. And then, and as, so the question is then, or how do how do we do that? How do we draw near to God? Well, obviously we do that through His Word. Uh, Romans twelve two says, this, "Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind." Right. 
Again, this world is always going to try to have you focus on other things and look at other things, other things that are more desirable than God himself. But when we get into the word of God, right, his word washes over our minds and renews our minds, and it gets us focused back on the Lord to draw closer to him. Uh, you know, we draw near to God when we worship and praise, right, in prayer. Uh, Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. We also draw near to God when, we, uh, when we're asking for his counsel. Our Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our, our, our desire should be to draw near to, to the Lord. And, uh, and these are, you know, these are just some of the ways that we do this. And when we're, when we're seeking the Lord in prayer, when we're seeking him in his word, uh, when we come together in fellowship, right, when we, when we um, commune together as a body of Christ, um, we're able to just have this, this encouragement and, and we build each other up in the Lord to, to draw closer to him. And what happens after all those things, when we start doing that, drawing near to the Lord, um, is we, we kind of see, see God for who he is, right, holy. Right? Yes, we know that God is loving and he's forgiving, and he's gracious, but he's also holy because it says here in verse 8, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, right? Again, he's just kind of like telling them straight up, hey, you guys, are, you guys are sinning, you guys are messing up, cleanse your hands, right? Be clean. You know, when we come to Christ, uh, there, there, there's a, a change is required when we come to Jesus, right? We can't stay the same. There, there's no way that that can happen in our lives. And when we come to the Lord, um, He's the one who cleanses us. But what we're called to do when we do get caught up in sin and get tripped up, right, we, we ask for forgiveness, we repent, we confess our sins, and uh, we're made clean again, right? We can, we can continue on with the Lord, and we can have that intimacy with Him. And He tells them, because this is what happens when we draw near to God, we realize, man, Lord, like, I'm not where I need to be, right? Like, th- th- that conviction is there, and it should be there. That, that's, that's a good, healthy place to be as a Christian when we're like, man, this isn't the right thing I should be doing. I want to draw near to God. I don't. I want to get these things behind me, right? I want to repent. That's the idea of repentance, and I want to draw near to God. And these things are going to happen. It says, "Cleanse your hands, you filth, uh, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded." The idea behind double-minded is it's two-souled. That's that's the idea. Divided in interests, um, uncertain, wavering, and doubting. And and this is again, this is what happens when we uh, when we get caught up in sin. Um, Right? We're, we're wavering. Our, we have divided interest. And, uh, but what we're called to do is to draw close to the Lord. And, and uh, our hearts need to be made, right, made clean again. We need to repent. And I like, again, in Psalms 51, this is what David says. He's, he realizes, too, he's like, Lord, I want to be made right, but I can't do it apart from you. Like, I need to confess to you, and I need you to help me. And he says this in Psalms 51, verses 10 through 12. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of, my, of, of your salvation, and restore and, uh, and sustain me with a willing heart. I like that because, again, he realizes, he's like, I can't do this, Lord, apart from you. Right? Any, anything in our life as Christians, whether it's a job, whether it's raising a family, or, or whatever the case is, whether it's you know, um, whatever the case is, like, apart from Christ, we can't do those things, right? We need the Lord, and, uh, and we need to understand those things. And then he says in verses 9, he says, Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. And again, it's the idea of, like, understanding, hey, this is what our sin does in our life. Because it's possible to not take sin seriously, right? To kind of just, like, whatever, it's a carefree attitude, not, not um, towards it. But if we really want to draw near to the Lord, like we, we have to do away with it, right? We have to have attitudes like, Lord, I, I, I need this to, to be away. We need this attitude of, of brokenness and, uh, and repentance and, and a conviction. And so, and this is what he's talking about here when he's telling the believers, hey, like you need to, you need to realize like what sin does in your life, right? <clears throat> like I have, I have, obviously I have kids and, and when they do wrong things, like we talk about it. It's like, hey, this is, this is why this is serious to us, right? Because it's easier just to tell them, hey, just do what I said right? Because I'm your, I'm your dad. Just do that. But I want to tell him why. It's like, hey, because these things lead to, to deeper things. If you're going to start dabbling in these little sins, like, it's, it's going to consume your life if you don't, if you don't uh, 
if you don't get it in check. Or it's going to destroy your life. And this is what's, what's going to happen. And uh, maybe because the Bible's clear, right, it's sin is only, it's only good for a season. And, uh, and I try to instill that, especially in my kids, and be like, hey, this is, this is why we don't right, watch these type of movies or do these certain things or do this or allow you to go on certain things because it's an open door to something, to some type of sin and, and something else, and uh, we don't want that for you. And, you know, they're, they're at that age, so maybe they just think, oh, mom and dad, just, they're just, uh, they just don't want us to have any fun. And, uh, you know, we, so we try to have these conversations with them. This is the reason why. And we tell them, like, because I've been there, right? And, and uh, I've been there. I've, I've been caught up in sin and consumed by it. And, and uh, yeah, it was fun for a season. But after after that, it wasn't, right? It um, it kept me in bondage. It, it, it kept me depressed and kept me all these things uh, that weren't good for me. And uh, and trying to tell them that and try to communicate those things to that, that this is what sin does in the life of a, especially of a Christian. Like, it's, it's, it's never a good thing. Um and, uh, and the Lord loves you too much to allow you to continue in that. And then he says in verse 10, humble yourself, right, in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Again, what was happening, what we're going to see now, again, pride was in this, we're in these believers, right? They were prideful. They thought they, they knew better. They thought they were, uh, they, uh, even, even they were better than the, some of the other believers in the church. And uh, James right away says, hey, you got to humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. What they were trying to do is exalt themselves over their over their other brothers and sisters in the Lord. And this is what was happening because of that. In verse 11, do not speak against one another, brethren. Right? Do not speak evil against each other. He who speaks against, against his brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. And it might seem like he's kind of switching gears here again, but it, again, it's, it's connected with that idea of submitting to God and, and, uh, and their boastful pride and what was going on. And again, uh, when those things are done, um, we, kind of, we kind of treat the rest of the church like they're less than, right? Even though we're all called, we're all, we, all, we all stand on common ground in Jesus Christ. There's no one greater or, or lower than, than each other. And this idea where he talks about do not speak evil in the Greek, the meaning behind it is, is that those who meet in corners and gather in little groups and pass on confidential information, which destroys the good name of those who are not there to, to defend themselves. I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, interesting definition. <clears throat> and again, that's, that's, this is what the idea was. They were, they were going around talking about each other, saying, oh, so-and-so is, is this, or being critical with each other, they were gossiping, um, all, these, all this evil type of talk that they were, they were doing. And it's, uh, and again, Sounds like a church in 2022, right? We, we don't, we don't, uh, we're, we're not um, exempt from that. And, and those type of struggles that they were dealing with back then, it's the same things we deal with today. And James would say the same thing. Hey, don't speak evil against each other. Like they're, we're called as a church to lift each other up, to edify each other, to, um, right, to point each other to Jesus because we, we all have a job to do, right? We all have, we all have a mission is to further God's kingdom. And, um, and they weren't doing that. Instead, they were talking about each other, um, right? Uh, they were comparing each other. Who was more spiritual than, than this? They were, they were being critical with each other. They were judging each other in a, in a critical fashion where they're just like nitpicking and finding every little thing wrong about their walk and what they were doing, right? Things like that. And uh, right, those people still exist in the church today. And uh, we're, we want to be gracious with them, obviously. But at the same time, we need to, um, you know, those things need, need to be dealt with in the right manner. And, and, and James is saying that here. He says, hey, you're, you're speaking um, against your brother or you're judging your brother. Um, you're, you're no longer being a doer of the law or a doer of the word, but you're being a judge of it. Right? You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. We're, we're all called to be doers of the word, right? And now some of these people in this church were just, they were, they were acting like they were above everyone else. They were prideful. They were boastful. So they're saying, hey, uh, they're pointing out everything wrong. Like Jesus kind of alludes to this, right? In the, in, the, in the Gospels where he talks about, hey, uh, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, I take the log out of your own eye, right? We, we understand the principle, and it seems like James, throughout, the, throughout his whole letter, he, he alludes to a lot of the teachings of Jesus. Um, but, but we understand that, and this is what was going on in this church, and they were having, uh, the, the believers, and they are having issues. And he says, uh, hey, and I like what he says here, because now you're not just a doer, you're not being a doer of the law, but you're being a judge. And then he says in verse 12, to kind of bring him back down to earth, to say there's only one judge, right? There's only one lawgiver, 
and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judges your neighbor, right? He kind of just tries to bring him back down to earth. He's like, hey, get over yourself. Like you're, you're, I know you think you're like, a, like holier than thou, but, but you're really not because you're full of pride, right? And we need to understand that the pride comes before the fall, right? We know, we know that verse, and James is trying to get them back to um, back on track with all these things. And uh, he talks about, like, he's saying about the law, and, and, and what he's talking about here is, is the commandment that Jesus gave. We know in John 13, where Jesus says, hey, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples because of your love for one another. Right? We're, not, we're not obeying that commandment of Jesus if we're being critical with each other and trying to compare each other, trying to see who's better than who or who, who's more spiritual than who. Um, all those things, and when we start doing that, we, we become negative and start talking behind each other's back and, and slandering each other. Um, it's not fitting for the family of God. In Ephesians 4.29, this is what Paul says, Let no unwholesome, unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear it, right? They were, they were talking about each other, saying all these things, but Paul says, no, like what we're supposed to be doing is edifying each other in the body of Christ, not just bringing each other down, not just nitpicking and, and, and being critical every single time. That's, that's not going to be helpful. Yeah, sometimes it's, there, there's times for those things, but, but to do it all the time is just going to, you're just going to put people in a, in a state where it's like, well, I'm just, I'm just going to fail, so why, why even bother? But Paul's like, no, no, no we're, we're called to build each other up. Every time we're together as a body of Christ, it's an opportunity for us to build each other up as Christians. And, uh, and that's what we're called to do. And, um, and this is, again, this is what he's, what he's talking about. Like when, when we get caught up in pride and all those things where, where we're not submitted to Christ, then it's going to be easy for all those things to come in and to think that we're, better than this or better than that. And now we get to this last part in verses 13 through uh, 17. It says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And again, it, it, it might seem like he's switching gears, but he's kind of talking about the same thing because um, these people were were prideful. It, it talks about this evil boasting that they had, and the idea behind this is is uh, is they're planning out their lives without seeking any counsel from or even considering God Himself. Or they're just like, oh, we're gonna go because I get during back in this time there was a lot of merchants in this area, a lot of Jewish merchants who would go to these different cities, and they're like, okay, we're gonna go to this city, we're gonna spend a year. They had it all planned out, like exactly how things are gonna go, and it's kind of like. How do you know that's going to happen, right? Like, uh, I always mess with my wife. It's like, hey, uh, the only reason, uh, the only reason why, um, or uh, you know, because she's she's a big time planner, and uh, I'm I'm not as much. Maybe I should be more, but I'm not as much. So like, it's kind of kind of drives her crazy, right? Um, but you know, she always makes plans and stuff. And I was like, all right, well, hopefully it works out. She's like, well, it, it's going to work out. I was like, that's cool, but just in case it doesn't, we're going to be fine, right? We're going to be fine. And, and what they were doing, though, these, these, uh, and, and what James is saying, he's not saying it's bad to make plans and do all these things or, or, or things of that nature, but, but it, it was their mindset behind it. it they thought, like, well, this, this is how it's going to turn. It's going to work out. Maybe you've met people like that. I've met people like that where they're like, yeah, I'm going to do this, and this is going to happen. This is going to all pan out. And, um, you know, and they're, like, confident in it. And I'm like, man, I hope it works out for you. Like, but it, it's almost like, like it's going to happen this way. And if it doesn't, uh, they don't even consider, it's like, well, what if it doesn't? I mean, and, and again, he's not saying that we, we, we shouldn't make plans or anything like that, but their whole idea is that they're making plans without seeking God himself and thinking like, hey, I, I got this. Um, I can do this myself. It's going to be fine. But he says here, he's like, hey, uh, for those of you who think that, in, in verse 14, he says, hey, but there's always these things like, yeah, you don't, you don't know what your life is going to be like tomorrow, right? But those things happen each and every day. Um, life can be there one day and not there the next day. And, and again, he's not, and what he's not saying as well is that we should have this fear. It's like, oh, we'll never make plans or never do anything like that. But, he, but he's, he's, he's trying to make us understand and say, hey, uh, um, our life belongs to the Lord, right? Like everything we need to do, we, we need to seek after the Lord. And, 
and all those things because he says your life is just it's just like a vapor it appears today and for a little while then it vanishes away and then he kind of gives the idea this is what our mindset should be like he says in verse 15 instead you ought to say if the lord wills right if the lord wills we will live and also do this or that because again there's always going to be uncertainties there's always going to be these things um He's not saying, again, we shouldn't make any plans at all. But as a believer, like, it, it, should, be, it should be this idea of, or this, this mindset of, like, hey, I need to seek the Lord. I want to do this or this, especially if it's a, maybe, a, you know, maybe a five-year plan. It's like, Lord, I, I want you to be in this plan, right? I want you to, to, do, to, to, to be. I remember when I first came on staff, someone asked me, it's like, so where do you see yourself in five years? I was like, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I just, I just know this is where the Lord has me now, and I'm going to be here until he shows me otherwise, right? And I love Pastor Z because we always get to talk. Like, he always has his door open for us. And one of the things he always asks us, he's always like, hey, uh, am, I, am, I, am I still, like, uh, do I still have a pulse on, like, the church and what's going on? Or am I, like, just out, an outdated dinosaur? Because if I am, then I need to step back. And that's what I love about him because he, he's, he's, he's not, like, you know, he, he knows, like, hey, like, the Lord is not going to have me in this position forever. And uh, so I want to make sure that I'm not in the way of God's plan. Because it's easy to be like, well, Lord, I mean, I'm, I'm doing your will. I'm up here, like, being the pastor. But he's very much like, if, if the Lord says, hey, it's time for you to step back, I, I wanna, he wants to be able to do that. And that's, that's such an awesome thing um, to, to see. But that's, that's kind of the idea that he's talking about, that there's, there's all these things out there. We can, we can make plans and even say, I want to make these plans, and well, I want to pray about it. And sometimes what, what we mean by that is like, Lord, I'm going to make these plans and I want you to bless them, right? And, uh, and then when it doesn't happen, we, we get upset about, to, about uh, we get upset, um, uh, we, we get mad at God and say, hey, God, why didn't you let this happen? But actually, right, we didn't really seek the Lord. We just say, I'm going to make these plans and Lord, it should be fine, right? This should be how it goes. But God, God's word says a lot about, right, about his will and what, and what his will is for our life. Ephesians 2.10 says this, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in him. Um, Acts 17.26 and 27 says this, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed time and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. And I love that because there's this idea, there's this understanding that God has, has set us in certain boundaries, right? Um, I know because we live in, in the, the great state of California, there's a lot of people leaving California, right, um, for, for greener pastures or whatever the case is. And I've been asked that before. It's like, hey, uh, are, are, like, what, if, what if things get worse here? Are you going to leave? I was like, God hasn't told me to leave yet. Like, um, and again, it, it, you know, I know people leave for different reasons, and, and I'm not saying anything at all. But uh, but I know for myself, you know, me and my wife prayed about it because yeah, it's easy when you see other things like, oh man, there's more freedom in this other state or whatever the case is. And and, and for us, it's like, well, this is where the Lord has us, and I know He's, I mean, He's clear in His Word that He's going to sustain us. If this is where He has us, then He's going to sustain us. He's going to see us through. So we need to, we need to, we need to be in His will, right? Because it's easy to be like, well, Lord there's more freedom there. I can do more free. I can do this. And we, and we can easily justify whatever it is that we want to do because it's God's will. But, but, um, but we need to seek that. And, and, and kind of in the word of God, there's, there's two things there. There's two kind of wills of God, if you will, for our life. And one of them is the first, the general will of God, right? Those, those ones are found in scripture. Like first Thessalonians four, three says this, for this is the will of God. Okay. Now we know it, right? The will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And there's other, other verses that say that. And uh, th these are the verses that are found in Scripture. They're, they're discovered in Scripture while we're reading and seeking the Lord. Um, but also, this is for every believer, right? Every believer, like, that, there's no one exempt from any of these verses that say, hey, this is what you need to be. Like, you need to love your, your neighbor as yourself, right? You need to love the body of Christ just as, as, as I have loved you, right? No, no believer is exempt from that. You understand? That's the general will of God in our lives. But also, um, there's a specific will of God for our lives, right? Like, uh, but the Bible doesn't say, right? I, I, don't, I don't turn to a page of Scripture and say, hey, this is exactly who you're going to marry and exactly these things. But you, you seek the Lord for those things. But what the, but the, what the Word of God does says is, is, hey, this is how you should be if you're going to get married, right? You need to obviously marry someone who 
loves me, right, who's a believer, this is what you should look for in a spouse. But also, more importantly, this is how you should be as a spouse, right, as a, as a, uh, as a man of God or a woman of God or, or someone who's, who's uh, potentially wanting to get married. Like, this is what the Bible says that you should be like, right, seeking the Lord, loving Him, all those things. Uh, when it comes, the, the Bible doesn't specifically say, hey, what kind of job you're supposed to have, but it tells you how you should be as a worker. You understand what I'm saying? And, and for us, we're, we're called to, uh, to seek the Lord's will for our lives, right? Some like the Lord called me to feeling of all places, right? I, you know, he could have called me somewhere else, but he called, he called me and my family here. That's, that's my, that's God's will for my life. It's not for, for everyone, right? It's not for uh, <clears throat> every Christian to be in feeling. And sometimes, you know, there's, there's a uh, missionaries who, who have good intentions, good hearts, but they're like, Oh, the Lord called me India. Everyone should be called to India. I'm not called to India. Sorry. Like that's not, and that's okay. That's okay because we're all the body of Christ, right? We've been talking about that in First Corinthians. Well, we all have different functions, or some missionaries, or some people in the church, or some people doing this, um, right? As as far as I know, right now, like I'm called to youth ministry, not children's ministry, yeah, right? And and this is this is a specific will for my life, and and I'm not trying to get every every uh, person who's able to serve in the in the in the youth ministry, but like the youth is the only place that like where you need to be at. Like no, like God might have him somewhere else, and and uh, and that's okay. But this is what we're this is what we're called to do. And again, the only way um, when if we're first submitted to the general will of God, then 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 God is going to show us right His His specific will for our life. Like if we're not doing the the things that Scripture say, like loving our neighbor and, and uh, you know whatever, not not getting indulging in these certain sins, and then I'm like, Lord, show me right, show me where you where you want me to be in the next five years. Uh, I don't know if he's going to show you those things, right? Because you're not even doing the simple things, the, the things you're supposed to be doing. You think he's going to give you these other things? I don't know, right? And then uh, he goes on, and again, in verse 15 and 16, he says, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you, you're, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Again, this is the idea of, of them trusting in themselves, not even seeking the Lord and just... And just looking, it's like, I got this covered. I can take care of it. I can handle it myself apart from the Lord. And, uh, and we know that's as, as Christians, we're not supposed to do those things. In verse 17, the last verse, he says this, Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin, right? Like, if you read the Bible enough, you, you, it's, it's pretty clear to understand, like, what we're supposed to do as Christians and not supposed to do, right? How we're supposed to live and not supposed to live. Um, 2 Peter 2.21 says this, For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness and having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed um, down to them, right? That's kind of, that's a, that's a, that's a hard thing to, to uh, it's one of those, those hard verses, right? Because he, he talks about this, like, hey, if you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, like it's sin to you, like you should know, right? And, and uh, it's, it's a deliberate, um, purposeful ideas like, hey, I, I know that this is God's will or this is what I'm supposed to do. I don't want that. I want something else. And it's into you. And, and, and when, when, when the hard times come or the other consequences for those sins happen, um, and we have to deal with them and we shake our fist at God, say, Lord, why is this happening? So, well, I mean, you, you knew, right? You knew better, right? Again, if, if one of my children, they do something wrong or they have consequences, they're kind of like, I can't believe it. Why is this happening? It's like, well, no, you, you knew exactly what you're doing, what you weren't supposed to do, and you did it anyway. And I mean, we're pretty clear that there's going to be consequences. But we understand that God loves us enough to not allow his child to sin successfully, right? He's, he's going to correct you. Correction is fun. I don't like being corrected. I don't like being disciplined, but it's necessary for our lives as Christians. But if we do, back in verse 7, if we submit to God first, right? If we submit to him, um, then we're not going to have to deal with correction as much, right? As, as discipline, because we're in God's will and we know what we're called to do, and we... Uh, we, we know our proper rank, right? We know what God has called us to do, and, and we're going to be doing that. And, that's, and that's, a, that's the best place to be is in God's will. Amen? Amen. That's good? All right, let's pray, and then uh, we'll be done. Lord, uh, Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, that, that your word is, is uh, it's powerful, Lord. It's living. It's active. Lord, I know sometimes, um, Lord, I can talk faster or, or stumble over my words or even not be uh, maybe as... Uh, clear as I, as I should be or could be, Father, but we thank you that your word doesn't come back void. But Lord, we, uh, I pray, Lord, that our desire, Father, would be to, to follow after you, Lord, um, to seek you, Lord. You're, you're the God who saved us, Lord, the God of our salvation. There's nothing else, Lord, out there that's, 
that compares to you, Father. Lord, as your children, Father, you're not going to allow us to, to, to sin successfully, Lord. Um, you're going to correct us, Lord. You're going to discipline us, Father, Lord. Um, but the best place to be is submitted to you, Lord, in your, in your will and, and desiring to, to be pleasing to you, Lord. Not, not our will be done, but your will would be done, Lord. I pray that would be the desire of our hearts, God. So be with your people this evening. Be with the rest of our time. And Lord, as we worship you, Father, Lord, um, Lord, you're worthy of our worship. Lord, we just want to lift you up in your name. Amen.